Perhaps no number is more important to investors than their portfolio's rate of return. After all, what better way is there to measure your investment performance than to ask, what's my investment portfolio done for me lately? Trouble is, it's usually not so simple to answer this seemingly simple question, and for good reason. There's several ways to calculate your rate of return, and each method has its own strengths, weaknesses, and outcomes. I'm Justin Bender, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital in Toronto. In this two-part video series, I'm going to show you two popular ways to calculate your portfolio's rate of return. In today's part one video, I'll cover the time-weighted rate of return. And in part two, we'll take a look at your money-weighted rate of return. By the time we're through, I'll have explained how and why each method can produce different results, so you can determine when each one is most appropriate for you. When it comes to calculating rates of return, the time-weighted rate of return is your holy grail of portfolio performance benchmarking. Because it completely eliminates the effect of cash flowing in and out of the portfolio, it's the rate of return that mutual funds and ETFs use when preparing their published performance reports. You calculate the time-weighted rate of return in three broad steps. First, you divide your reporting period into sub-periods, one for each time you made a contribution or withdrawal. Next, you calculate a mini-total return for each sub-period. You then geometrically link each of these mini-returns to arrive at the time-weighted rate of return over the entire period. And geometric linking involves adding one to each sub-return, multiplying these figures together, and subtracting one from the end result. Let's see how the time-weighted rate of return works by applying it to three hypothetical investors. All three of them kicked off 2020 with $100,000 invested in the Vanguard growth ETF portfolio, Vigro. Then along came that pesky pandemic and their portfolios decreased to $77,985 by March 23rd, 2020. Now, let's make some assumptions about each investor's next steps. Investor one, we'll call him Michael, doesn't contribute to or withdraw from his portfolio during 2020. He ends the year with a portfolio value of $110,828. Investor two, Job, adds $10,000 to his portfolio's VGRO position at the market bottom on March 23rd. By the end of 2020, his portfolio is worth $125,039. And investor three, Buster, panics during the stock market meltdown. On March 23rd, when his portfolio value has dropped to $77,985, he sells $10,000 out of his VGRO units and withdraws the cash from his portfolio. His portfolio ends the year at $96,616. Since Michael didn't contribute to or withdraw funds from his portfolio during 2020, his time-weighted rate of return is easy to calculate. You simply take his ending portfolio value of $110,828, divide it by the beginning portfolio value of $100,000, and subtract one. This gives Michael a 2020 return of 10.83%. However, to accurately compare returns among our three investors, we'll go ahead and calculate the sub-period returns for all three, including Michael. I'll also throw in a spoiler alert. The math I'm about to walk us through is going to reveal that all three investors earn the same 10.83% time-weighted rate of return for their respective portfolios. After any Scooby moment you might have about that, you'll realize this makes sense. All three investors held Vigro and only Vigro all year. So in this super simplified example, their time-weighted rates of return will be identical to the 2020 return of Vigro, which was also 10.83%. Now to that fun math. We'll start by calculating Michael's return for subperiod 1, December 31st, 2019 to March 23rd, 2020. During subperiod 1, his portfolio started at 100,000 and ended at $77,985. Dividing the ending value by the beginning value and subtracting 1 provides us with a subperiod return of -22.01%. Next, We'll calculate Michael's return for subperiod 2, from March 23rd, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. During the second subperiod, the portfolio started at $77,985 and increased to $110,828 by year end. Dividing the ending value by the beginning value and subtracting 1 
gives us a subperiod return of positive 42.11%. Finally, we'll geometrically link Michael's subperiod returns to obtain his time weighted rate of return for 2020. To do this, we add one back to each subperiod return, multiply the results together, and then subtract one. Michael ends the year with his time weighted rate of return of 10.83%. As mentioned earlier, Job also started the year with $100,000 invested in Vigro, and his holdings had also dropped to $77,985 by March 23rd. But then, Job added $10,000 to his Vigro position, increasing his portfolio value to $87,985. By the end of 2020, his portfolio had grown to $125,039. Following the same steps, we start by calculating Job's subperiod 1 return from December 31st, 2019 to March 23rd, 2020. Just as with Michael's identical portfolio, his subperiod 1 return was the same negative 22.01%. We then calculate Job's subperiod 2 return from March 23rd, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. For the start date, we'll use the portfolio value after the cash flow occurred. During the second subperiod, the portfolio started at $87,985, or $77,985, plus his $10,000 contribution. It increased to $125,039 by the end of the year. Dividing the ending value by the beginning value and subtracting 1 gives us a subperiod return of positive 42.11%. Geometrically linking Job's two subperiod returns again yields a time weighted rate of return of 10.83% for the year. See what I mean about those identical returns for identical holdings during identical holding periods? But to really drive the point home, let's calculate Buster's time weighted rate of return. He also started with $100,000 invested in Vigro at the beginning of 2020. And on March 23, 2020, his portfolio was also worth $77,985. On that date, he withdrew $10,000, bringing his portfolio value down to $67,985. By the end of 2020, his portfolio value stood at $96,616. Using the same calculations as before, Buster's subperiod 1 delivered a return of, you guessed it, negative 22.01%. During subperiod 2, when his portfolio started at $67,985 and increased to $96,616, Buster's time weighted rate of return was again positive 42.11%. Finally, geometrically linking the two subperiod returns provides us with a time weighted rate of return for the year of 10.83%. Again, this identical 10.83% annual return for all three of our investors is precisely the result we should expect. The way we calculate the time-weighted rate of return is supposed to wipe out the effect of individual contributions and withdrawals, revealing the annual return that Vigro delivered to all three investors who held the fund throughout 2020. If you're catching my drift, this makes the time-weighted rate of return ideal for benchmarking different portfolio and fund managers. It's especially good at comparing various active managers' investment strategies. Unfortunately, while the time-weighted rate of return is useful for mutual funds and portfolio managers, it's impractical to deploy for your own do-it-yourself portfolio. First, there's all that math. Plus, even if you had an easy way to crunch all those numbers, the data is hard to come by to begin with. You'd need to know your portfolio value on any day you contributed to or withdrew cash from your portfolio. Your discount broker typically doesn't report these values in your account statements. Which brings us to another popular way to wrap your head around your returns. Your money-weighted rate of return. I'm Justin Bender of PWL Capital, and if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to hear more about money-weighted versus time-weighted rates of return, please subscribe to the Canadian Portfolio Manager YouTube channel so we can let you know as soon as we publish part two of today's series.